Hello viewers and welcome to a new STM32 World Basics video, I guess. Uh, at the time of recording this one, uh, whoops, I have uh, just published uh, this video, STM32 World Tutorial video number 65, where I'm talking about bit banging uh, pulse fit modulation on a a pin that doesn't have a timer channel um, but using a timer interrupt uh, and I thought it was uh, about time to dig in a bit further on interrupt handling on the STM32. Uh, please stick with this video to the end if you like it like and subscribe uh, if you don't like it please let me know why you don't like it uh, that helps me a lot. Now the interrupt, in order to understand the interrupt handling in uh, STM32, you should look at the reference manual. Uh, and I have opened here the STM32F401 reference manual. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is pure laziness. Uh, well, I still have my relay board uh, connected, so if I want to run anything that is connected and I could run it on this relay board, this relay board have a, a F402, which is an STM32401 uh, on, on board. So uh, I will basically pick that to look at that. Uh, so let's look at the, the reference manual and if you go to uh, chapter 10 in the reference manual for the F401 but you should read the reference manual for whatever MCU you are using you will see a description of the nested vectored interrupt controller NBIC in the STM32 and that is an absolutely core uh, feature of all I believe all ARM processors and especially all STM32 ARM processors. So have a look at, read through this chapter. Uh, it is uh, good to understand. Now, the vector, every ARM processor have a vector table. And the vector table, if you look at the binary that you upload the binary image that you upload, uh, your, your firmware that you upload to an MC uh, STM32. The first four bytes is the stack pointer. The next four byte is an address where your application is starting the entry point of your application. And after that is the interrupt vectors. Now, where does an interrupt go? Now, whether the interrupt is actually triggered or not is controlled by the NVIC. So uh, you will see that you have a number of fixed interrupt that is always there, which is the reset vector. It is the memory fault, heart faults, and all that. And then you have down here, you have all the external, some of them are internal, interrupts it's the external line interrupts it's the dma interrupts it's the timer interrupts and etc 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 now this table is defined in hardware so each mcu will have its own most of the stm32s are roughly equivalent uh, but each mcu will have its own interrupt table so if we look at the code generated by stm32 cube mx you will see that under the core startup you will have a bit of a sampler code here and this assembler code is uh, standard and i just verified uh, by putting in a comment it doesn't get overwritten this is generated once when you start the process uh, the the project and it will never get overwritten so you can actually tweak this startup assembler code um, to your liking and you will see uh, down here after the initialization stuff uh, where is it here the reset handler uh, how that does and down here you have these interrupt vectors so if we look at these interrupt hand, uh, vectors you have a reset handler heart fault 
handler, mem page handler, and if you look down at this, you will see, for example, uh, where you said uh, you could see a timer four, we'll call timer four IRQ handler. That is the one I was playing with in the previous video. Now, if this code is not generated or included, you will see down here at the bottom that there is a weak. Every single one of these calls have a weak uh, call to it, and it will go in by default. It will go into the default handler, and the default handler is defined up here as a reset handler. Where is the default handler? Reset handler default handler it's here and you will see that it is basically looping around here and it will never get past that point so if an interrupt happens and the nyvic is configured to trigger on that interrupt but you have not implemented any code to handle that interrupt then it will end up in this loop now the reason why they just don't just throw a hard fault is that you can actually break it at that point if you're running it in a debugger and then you could see where the hell it was coming from. You still have your stack trace and all that, uh, your call trace. So uh, that is a convenient way of doing it. Now, if we look at the way it will typically be done in STM32, you have up under the system core, you have the NVIC configuration, and here you can trigger what interrupts need to be generated. Now, if in this case we have a UART defined, uh, we could enable the global UART interrupt, and then let's see what happens if we generate the code with that. Now, the assembler start of assembler code will not be changed by this. But if we go into the source, we will have this file generated by cubemx called stm32f4xx underscore it for interrupt. And you will see in here that it will now generate a function in here, which is calling our IRQ handler. Now, what I n noticed and what it was actually pointed out to me by a viewer and I exploited in the last video is that it is actually possible in CubeMX to go over to the code generation tab and say, well, I don't want to generate this. Now, let's generate the code again. And we will see that the interrupt file will now no longer have that interrupt, but it is still defined in the startup code and it will be called. So if I was running this now and a UART interrupt happened, it will go into that endless loop and it will stick there uh, forever and ever. Uh, so we need to, if, if we want to do this and define our own, we have to define our own interrupt handler, which is perfectly acceptable. We can do this. So let's go back to generating this code. Uh, now, the way hell is uh, developed, uh, made, designed, uh, hell needs to check for every possible constancy. So if we go in and look at this UART interrupt handler, that will call a file called hell UART interrupt handler. And if we go in and look at that, you will see that these interrupt handlers are long because they need to check every single constancy. And the feature I exploited in the last video was the fact that if I know what is going to happen, I know what interrupts can happen, then I don't need to check all this. So that can be optimized. Now, there's a lot of criticism out there about hell. Say, oh, it's bloated. It's not, no, it's not bloated. Hell is just, it needs to take care of every single constancy. And there is nothing 
that prevents you from optimizing stuff generated by hell. Hell doesn't prevent you from optimizing. It just makes your life easier if you don't need it, if you have no performance issues. So, see, we are still in the same. It is a very, very long function. It ends there. So, hundreds of lines of codes that get executed every time. A UR interrupt is handling unless we optimize that. Uh, so, that is, uh, well, I... How long is this video? About 10 minutes, 11 minutes uh, by now. Uh, I think these uh, basics videos needs to be less than 15 minutes, so I better stop babbling soon. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to introduce how this interrupt handler is, how interrupts are handled by the non, uh, the nested vector interrupt controller or what? Probably controller. Yes, controller. Uh, and I mean, read the section in the reference manual about this and uh, try to. Uh, I think one of the things I learn a lot from is actually looking at the code that is generated by STM32 CubeMX. Sometimes I can optimize that. Not always, but sometimes it is possible to optimize the code generate because ST have to take care of every single constituency and in many cases on embedded program well I know that won't happen here uh, and stuff like that so you can you can basically bypass some of those checks uh, in your own code if you need to optimize something so that is pretty much how interrupts are handled on an STM32F4 or indeed pretty much any ARM processor. I don't know, uh, I think all ARM processors have uh, something like this. They might call it something else. Uh, I think the nested vector interrupt controller is a ST microelectronic term. Uh, I'm not sure. It could be an ARM term, um, but I haven't checked up on that. Uh, but I suggest you familiarize yourself with the section about the NVIC and what it can do and how it works. Uh, you don't have to understand all these registers, but if you want to optimize it, it might be a way to optimize further. So that is about it. As I said earlier, if you like this video, please like and subscribe and spread the word about share is always good. Uh, these videos, if you like them, sharing with friends and colleagues and so on and so forth. Um, and as usual, have a wonderful rest of the day.